So, tonight we're proud to have Del Stecker, uh, who wrote the multiple award-winning World War II naval classic, The Lady Gangster, which is over here, A Sailor's Memoir. This is, um, as told to, memoir relates to the never-before-told saga of the 327 Chicago boys called to duty in uh, early 1941 to man the USS Fuller, uh, affectionately known as the Lady Gangster. Stecker poignantly shares the personal story of everyday heroes, the unknown sailors who routinely performed heroic deeds without praise or recognition. The U.S. Naval Institute's proceedings called the Lady Gangster a spirited tale. World War II History Magazine gave it two thumbs up. And most importantly, the men who knows best, World War II veterans, uh, naval veterans, declare it an exceptional book. Uh, so I'm proud to present Mr. Stecker. Okay. Does this thing work? Do I need to work this? It should. Yeah. Okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, that's my first book. Uh, this is the second book, and um, I believe um, you were under the impression I was going to talk about it tonight. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me back. I was here about three and a half years ago, and uh, uh, whenever someone's invited back a second time, I guess it means I was okay. So, uh, But I want to apologize for being somewhat devious, because we talked about that I talk about my second book, Sailor Man, but um, I can't talk about this book without talking about the first one, which... Rich just mentioned. So um, you get two for one tonight, okay? And if you were at the last time, I'm not going to go over that in, 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 in depth. I might just pick it up a little bit. So I'm going to talk about um, this one in a minute, but I want to share with you some things about The Lady Gangster because the second book, although it's not a sequel, it grows out of the first book, and there's a certain point where they chronologically uh, uh, share the same story. So um, I'm a, a writer by uh, profession and one of the things I found out recently as a writer, I'm not so much really a writer, I'm a storyteller. That's what I really do. So if you'll let me tell a story tonight, uh, I promise you're going to have a good time. I'm going to meld these two books together in a story and I'm going to have some other stories about myself and how all this happened. And I think it'll make some sense. And in the end, I hope what it will do will give you a sense of that memoir is storytelling and really um, a great deal of the good parts of history are stories about regular people. So the book, The Lady Gangster, uh, came out of uh, a personal experience. Uh, about 12 years ago, I wanted to become a writer. I ran away from my life. I became a writer. And in the process, uh, I wrote a couple novels. And they were picked up by a publisher. And, and right when they were picked up, I then had this impulse. I wanted to write about the, uh, my experience and how I learned about my father's time in World War II. And I wrote a short story called The Broken Radio. And I was going back to when I was 16 years old. And I had to drive my father from Bureau Beach, Florida to right south of Chicago uh, with a broken radio in the car. I was 16, my dad was 50, we were like this, and as we were pulling out of the driveway, I said, tell me about your World War II experience from beginning to end. I figured that way I'd just, you know, be able to turn myself off and we just started. Well, he told me the story and it really affected me. Uh, he and I became very close. It became the reason why I was interested in history in, in many ways. And I always carried around that, that experience of the broken radio in a car because my father started sharing the story of how he served on uh, the prototype of the attack transports in World War II. And if you see the picture here, that's why the, the attack transport, that's the USS Fuller, and it was APA-7. Uh, originally it was uh, uh, AP-14. They changed the designation early in the war to attack transports. They actually made it into a, an official class of ship. And during World War II, there were 275 attack transports. Now, why this is re uh, important is that all of the initial crew on this ship were all from Chicago. That's where the Lady Gangster gets its name. It was called the Gangster, affectionately, and I called it the Lady Gangster because in my mind, my father always referred to it as she, and so I just thought of it as that. Well, this was the, one of the prototypes, the very first uh, uh, attack transports. And if you know, in World War II, 
we went to the beaches. Uh, very rarely did somebody pull up to a, a, a dock in some kind of a port city and disembark troops the way it had been done in, in previous wars. Um, the, 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 the reason uh, things were different was because of the Higgins boat. Um, this is a loaded Higgins boat, what they look like with a full complement of people on there, 36 feet long. Um, and the uh, USS Fuller, the, the gangster, was one of the very first uh, attack transports, which would just come up to the edge of the battlefield, so to speak, uh, right off the islands or right off as in D-Day, right off of the, the beach. They drop the Higgins boats off the side, and everybody's seen those movies where the guys jump off on the rope nets and go in, and, and they off they go. Well, this revolutionized warfare. And if you go back to the, uh, the quotations of, of this, uh, Higgins um, was complimented by Eisenhower and said, without Higgins, we wouldn't have had World War II and would have been victorious. And Adolf Hitler said, without those boats, he would, he would not have lost. You know, uh, so he's complimented from both sides. At one time, 90% of all of the ships in the US Navy were Higgins designs of various forms and fashion. And those are originally shallow bottom uh, boats. They took a draft of maybe uh, anywhere from six to 20 inches, and they were made to skim across the bayous and swamps of uh, Louisiana. Uh, supposedly, he said to deliver um, crews out to the oil rigs, but actually he was also rum running. Um, and he designed all these wonderful boats. Um, so uh, I wrote this story about, we'll go back here to the attack transport. Uh, the Fuller, uh, what's really interesting about that, that situation with my dad was that he and my uncles joined the, the reserves in 1940. It wasn't out of great patriotism. They just were, you know, my uncle actually ran off and joined up, and my father was told to join by his mother to take care of his brother. So uh, in 1940, in August of 40, they joined the reserves and never had any uniforms or training. They went to uh, meetings twice a week, I mean uh, twice a month, and they got paid about 40 bucks a month pay. And they, my father and my uncle were on the swim team and the volleyball team, and they went to lectures. They had no uniforms. And it wasn't until, um, the uh, January of 41, when they were called up to active duty, and there's my father on the left and my uncle on the right, and that's the first time they were ever in uniform, on the day they left to active duty. They never went to boot camp, they went to Seattle, and that's where my dad and my uncle were introduced to uh, being in the Navy, along with 327, well, 325 uh, fellow uh, members of what was partially the Naval Reserve in Chicago, and also what was known as the Illinois Naval Militia. Imagine that. So I'll go back here. They, they go on this ship, and if you remember the, 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 all the booms that bring the Higgins boats over to the side, and that's how they took the troops to the shore. My father was sent to uh, San Diego early in 41 to unwrap the very first surf boat. That's what they were called. They were not called Higgins boats. It was a surf boat, and it did not have the blunt uh, uh, forward drop, the gate on it. It actually had a regular, like a speedboat front. And my father unwrapped the very first one, and they learned how to uh, play with these surf boats. And then they went back up to San Diego. They commissioned the Fuller. They came down to San Diego. They picked up the rest of the surf boats, and they practiced a few times. They went around through the Panama Canal. They went to Charleston and they picked up some Marines that were from Camp Lejeune and Paris Island, and then they took them in the summer of 41 to Iceland where we had the first invasion of World War II. We were not at war at that time, but we invaded Iceland by dropping off the first Marine expeditionary force on Iceland, and we took over the country. So they didn't get a credit for the invasion because no one was shooting them. Uh, and then the, 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 this ship uh, went back and forth around uh, uh, the uh, North Atlantic, and the war started in uh, December of 41, and it served in the Atlantic and the Caribbean for about six months, and then it went to Guadalcanal and into the Pacific, where it received nine battle stars, the most of any number for attack transports. What's interesting about this ship is that somewhere early in its life, it was cut in half, extended 100 feet, and repowered. 
So they made it actually a larger ship. If you go back in the history of this ship, it was originally laid out in Alameda during World War I, and it was known later as the SS Archer, and it actually did deliver troops for the US. So it actually started out as a transport ship. If you go back even further, and it came out from after the writing of the book, The Lady Gangster, then some people got interested in the ship. They went back to the, the records of the Bethlehem Steel Company in Alameda, and they realized that it was not the SS Archer. It actually was commissioned. There were six hulls that were commissioned by the British Admiralty for World War I service, and it was originally supposed to be Her Majesty, Her, His Majesty's ship. Yeah, keep on thinking about it. It was, it was way before Elizabeth. His Majesty's ship, the War Wave. So its keel was originally laid in 1916 as, an, as a tra transport ship. And it's interesting, it did not serve in World War I. Uh, for the British, it actually served for the US. It was then bought, uh, made into a civilian ship, and in 1940 it was purchased. It, it was actually the uh, SS Newport News, and it became the USS Fuller. So it's, it's, its lineage is actually, it was meant to be a transport ship. It actually was the prototype for this whole model of putting on booms, having Higgins boats, which were not even dreamed of back in World War I, and uh, it became the prototype, and it delivered troops starting at Guadalcanal. It's, it uh, delivered troops, I'll give you the, 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 the listing of where it did it. It did uh, Guadalcanal, uh, Bougainville, Saipan Tinian, Peleliu, twice in the Philippines, and Okinawa. It got two battle stars for uh, its service in um, uh, the Solomon Islands, in Guadalcanal and the Solomon's Islands, which was really rare. It got an extra battle star because its captain, which was a Naval, gra 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 Naval Academy graduate with four stars, a full stripe, a full four stripe captain, he was uh, given rank as a Commodore, became Chief of Staff of the Amphibious Forces, and was given the Navy Cross for their resupply effort of Guadalcanal. So that's why they got a second battle star for the invasion of Guadalcanal. So it went on and it became a very, very well-known ship. It was kind of the prototype and that was my dad's experience. So, and I'm kind of touting that book. It really, whoop, <laughs> the ghosts are here. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about that book because this other one really came out of it. So this book, the first one, has been used as a template for um, modern military um, memoirs. Here's some of the things that's in it. It's, it's full of oral accounts and oral history. It, it, it uses diaries and journals, photos, illustrations, maps, letters, ship's logs, formal and informal, action reports, newspaper articles, combat reporters uh, articles from combat reporters, two poems, and it's also listed as biography and autobiography. It's autobiography because there's portions of it that the individuals mentioned in it, like my father and other crew members are talking about their experience. And it's autobiographical because of the chapter that I wrote about myself. So uh, it's a very interesting book. So uh, as I said, it chronicles uh, 327 guys that were from the same neighborhoods in the Chicago and Cook County area. On the left is my father. On the right is my uncle. They were both on that ship. They were plank holders. And if you look at them, uh, there's a portion of the book where it says they were green as green can be. Uh, they were not old salts and they weren't real sailors, but my, my dad served five years on that ship and I always love showing his next picture. That's him on the right. Now look at the difference between the man on the left and the man on the right. Okay? By the way, the, the lady in the middle is uh, my dad's one of his favorite cousins. She's very attractive. And that's his cousin, Anne, who everybody in the family had lost track of. And when the book came out, she got a copy, and she got back in touch with me and the family. And she just passed away a year and a half ago. She lived in Alaska. So we'd lost track of Anne, and then we got back in touch with her. And the man on the left is uh, the other brother in the family, is my uncle, that went to World War II in the Army uniform. And there's another story. She looks like Judy Garland, and he looks like De Niro. <laughs> that's interesting. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that gives you a little feel for uh, that book. Um, and I'd like to add at the end what happened with that book. It came out in 2009. Uh, I was here in 2013 to talk to you guys, or 2012. Uh, and uh, I had no intent of being a nonfiction writer. 
my, my other work is all fiction, and I've had good reviews, and I sell some books, and I think that's really neat, but that book has outsold all my other books. And that book is the one I'm always asked to speak on, and now I'm also asked to speak on the second book. I actually do a speech about what's, what I've learned from this process, and what I've learned about the veterans of World War II and, and, and writing memoir. But uh, I'm gonna segue into the next book real quick here. But this first book, um, what happened to it was it won a couple national awards. Uh, the one I'm proudest of is it got, it got the uh, Gold Award for Best Nonfiction at Branson Stars and Flags. And every year in Branson, Missouri, there's over 125,000 veterans come together in the largest conclave of veterans every year. And in 2009, it was selected as the best military book that year. So we went to Branson and had an award and a nice, nice uh, uh, time there. And it was a wonderful experience. And I left early and I was supposed to ride in the parade with Ollie North. So uh, no comment on Ollie North or where that is, but I passed up my, my, my limousine ride in the parade to wave with Ollie North. Uh, the other thing that came out of that, the experience was, um, I was uh, nominated to, to serve and become what is called a U.S. Navy writer on deck. And uh, the uh, MWR portion of the Navy, which is newer since my time, I was in the Army, but it's a newer kind of part. It's called Morale, Welfare, and Recreation, MWR. Okay, They had a program which they called Writers on Deck, and like the USO tours where they have rock stars come out, and Bob Hope and all that, somebody came up with the idea, well, they'd have writers do that. <laughs> so I was uh, given a nice honorarium, and I was taken by all my expenses, and I, I went to four Navy bases in the Mediterranean. I went to Sigamel Air Base in Sicily, I went to the two uh, Navy bases in Naples, and then I went to Rota, Spain, where this um, a Spanish Navy brought me on board a newer version of what they call the attack transport, which is very, it's configured differently, but I was an honored guest on the uh, attack transport, and I got to be on deck with them when they were loading up and getting ready to go on a mission. So it was really a neat experience to be a U.S. Navy writer on deck, and then later that year, I was uh, a finalist for the Military Writers Society of America as a finalist for the Author of the Year. Okay, so that's how I'm in this story here. It's really neat. So I put that to the side, and I go back to writing my uh, fiction. And um, early in my time of getting ready to write fiction, I was given advice by a famous writer, um, and he said, don't ever read or use anybody else's material because you're going to get sued. And he got sued. And uh, it cost his publisher, a publishing company and people a lot of money. And of course, he, he won the lawsuit because he didn't plagiarize somebody, but he got sued. And he says, whatever you do, don't touch anything. So on my website through my first book, and my website as an author, there's a way for people to get in touch with me as an author. And I get this email, and this person says, I read your book, The Lady Gangster. I really like it. And my father was on that ship. I have a whole bunch of letters. Would you read them? And my first reaction was, I remember what Pat Conroy, the other author, told me, don't read that stuff, you know. And this, the, the other hook on there was, this is really good letters. I think it would be good material for a book. So I said no. Well, this person persisted. He said, I think they're really good. I think you might be interested in them. So, oh, by the way, this is the, the, the my my dad and his two brothers. And in the end of the war, my grandmother always had that on the mantle and was very proud of the uh, service they did. Um, and I, I like to always mention that because she was in the Mother's March Against the War. 50,000 mothers went to Washington and petitioned uh, FDR not to have any involvement in the war. Well, my grandmother was one of those 50,000. And um, I like to put that up because it shows the, her, her contribution to World War II. So uh, there I am. I got another book. So how'd this happen? <coughs> well, Harold Nunley, the son of J.P. Nunley, kept on, and he was persistent. He called me. He emailed me. He wrote me letters. He said, I want you to read these letters. And finally, I said, OK, I will. If you'll give me a signed document in advance that says I own them, and I, you're never going to hold me accountable for what I use them for, if I ever did. 
So he sends me about five or six letters. And I'm going to tell you, um, my wife and I argue about this all the time. She likes the first book better than the second because she says, because I'm in it. So that's really a great answer. Thank you, honey. Um, but this second book is really important. And I want to share this with you tonight. And that's why I had to do the setup to get there. Harold said, read my dad's letters. So he sends me about six of them. And I'm amazed by their honesty, the, the raw passion, uh, just everything in them. I read them and I go, wow, these are really good letters. They're not like, thanks for sending me a, uh, a care package, or how's mom and dad at home, or did you see so and so. These were letters that were written by his father when he was in his 60s. And just as I had written, uh, asked my father when I was in that car with the broken radio, Dad, what did you do in the war? Please tell me about it. That took me on an adventure that went this way. Harold went to his father when his father was in his 60s and said, you screwed up your life. You screwed up everybody else's life. What happened? And his father sat down and wrote these letters. That's what makes this book. And I'm going to share with you, just recently, um, it received another review on Amazon. And the person who uh, reviewed it said, it's certainly a book that's worth reading. It can be read in one sitting in one day. He said, but don't do that. Read one or two chapters at a time and digest them. Because what I'm about to share with you now is an important thing about the service, the cost of war, and what really happened in World War II. Um, these were amazing letters, and they start from the perspective of J.P. Nunley, who was this person, 16 years old. He joined the Navy. He lied in order to become a sailor. Harold, his son, convinced me to read those letters. I read six, and then he hooked me by saying, I got some more. I said, how many? I said, well, I don't know. I got maybe two, three, four hundred pages. And he sent them all to me. And I read them. And I called Harold, and I said, there's a book here. I don't know what it's going to be like or what it's going to be. I just know there's one heck of a book here because your father was honest. And he said, well, you know, I never spent more than 10 hours as an adult in the company of my father. So right away I was awed. I was just blown back. Here's this honesty, this man answering to his son why he became an alcoholic, what happened to him. And he did it with such um, clarity of mind, uh, a little rough at places, never whining, never complaining. He just explained what happened to him, about the, what happened in the war. And the result is that Harold only spent 10 hours as an adult with his father. And I spent a lifetime in 17 years with my father until he died because I asked that question. And Harold asked the question, and here I am now. I've got all these letters, so what do I do? So the next step is Harold tells me that his Aunt Audrey, JP's <coughs> younger sister, is still alive. He says, maybe she'll tell you something about Dad. So I called up Audrey. She's... Uh, in her 70s now, almost 80. She lives in uh, California. And she had no idea that I was writing a book about her brother. She thought I was just doing a book in general about World War II and letters and people. And I just said, tell me about your brother. And she told me about the young boy here that everybody loved. They literally grew up outside of Talladega, Alabama. Uh, as you can tell here by the place, you know, the bed, you know, that's shoes, and, and the family got a little religious stuff up there, but this doesn't look like a really uh, uh, well-to-do family, does it? He's just a young man at the end of the Depression, the beginning of World War II, and he believed that it was his duty to serve. And during my conversations with her, and she's explaining that he was a great student in high school, everybody loved him. And I said, oh, come on, everybody, 
you can't say that. He's, he's dead and gone, and you're saying that about your brother. No, 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 no. This was the boy that everybody loved. He was the most popular, but he was humble. He was sweet. He played piano. He played guitar. Um, he was the purest, most wonderful human being anybody ever knew, and he wanted to be in the Navy. And while I'm talking to her, she explains to me about him always reading this one document that came through, a brochure for recruiting people into the Navy. And you know, with, uh, and this is where you can have your computer and the phone going at the same time. And I pull up on my computer and I start talking to her and I start describing over the telephone. She says, oh my goodness, that's, that's the document that he had. So now I had the document that got this young man to join the Navy at 16. He lied about it. His sister could not recall. How did he, in 1943, in January of 43 at 16, he just passed his 16th birthday in December, how did he get in the Navy? Well, he lied, I'm sure. They all did. But you know there were over 250,000 um, uh, soldiers, sailors, and Marines that lied about their age to get in an underage service. How young do you think the youngest one was? Twelve. Twelve. Yep, he was a sailor at Guadalcanal. He lost his uh, Purple Heart, and I think he also had a Bronze Star. And he didn't get those medals back until the 1990s. I think uh, President Clinton, one of the good things President Clinton did was reinstated his, his service. Stay with the microphone. Yeah, he was 12 years old when he was in, uh, in Guadalcanal. I forget the guy's name, but he's 12 years and eight months or something. Um, there's a, a group of, uh, it's, they're called the VUMS, V-U-M-S, uh, Veterans of Underage Military Service. And they even had some that served in Korea later on. But you know, with documentation and things, uh, that practice has long since been able to be, be uh, taken care of. Uh, I joined the military when I was 17, and my parents had to sign for me. Uh, but uh, there were a lot that signed up that were underage. Uh, during World War I, by the way, I, I did a lot of work on understanding about these underage service members. Do you know that uh, the age to enlist in World War I, uh, particularly in the UK, was 18? And so uh, it was known that all of the young men would take a piece of paper or cardboard and write the, the letters and uh, the numbers 18. They'd slip it in their shoe and they would stand in front of the recruiter and say, I solemnly swear, sir, that I'm over 18. <laughs> and, and they'd all wink and that's how they got in. Uh, in many cases, these guys were, were just given a piece of paper. They'd say, here, go take this home and have mom and dad sign it. And the next day he'd come in and say, here it is, my mom and dad signed it. No notarization, no, no checking, no nothing. Sometimes they would actually walk out the door and come back in five minutes with the signatures, you know, because they signed it themselves. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, stories in, 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 in about the underage service people. About 250,000. They do not know how many because, well, they made it through. Nobody knew about him until long after. Uh, actually, nobody actually th thought about his underage service until I brought up the issue. I said to his aunt, uh, his sister, I said, Audrey, I said he was 16. She said, I guess he was, you know, because you match his birth date and when he shot, you know, but nobody cared. Okay. Um, they did catch about 50,000 of them, like that guy that was uh, in the Navy in uh, Guadalcanal and sent him home. Uh, later on, that guy, by the way, when he was 15, he joined the Marines. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I forget that guy's name. But, but there's a bunch of them, and, and one of them that's really interesting, uh, there's, there's a fellow that was 15 that was given a battlefield commission in uh, Europe, and he was a first lieutenant at age 15. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so some of these guys are interesting. So here it is, J.P. Nunley, he's 16 years old. He joins the Navy. Um, he, in his letters, it's interesting, he never talks about boot camp. He never talks about how he enlisted, and he never talks about his first, uh, uh, he mentions it only briefly that he did end up in, at an airfield in Hawaii temporarily before he ends up back in, in uh, the Pacific on the USS Fuller. So he shows up, he joins in January of 43, and by December of 43, he's on the Fuller. And that's where his story really picks up. So that's where it merges with the other book. It's really interesting because from that point on, he goes through Bougainville, where I have two chapters in each book, that they have the same title, The Day the Bombs Dropped. Because at Bougainville, the USS Fuller is bombed, 
Um, a shell comes down, it's, and, and it's not described in this book, it's in the first one in detail. I actually have an interview with a guy that was right underneath where it happened. A uh, shell comes down and uh, the, the 500 pound bomb hits the barrel of their five inch gun and bounces sideways and does not go straight down into the magazine. It goes down a different chute and kills about eight guys. Well, JP was on the boat at that time. He was not a coxswain of a Higgins boat, which he later will spend six of the last nine invasions. He's a coxswain on the Higgins boat. He was relatively new on the Fuller. This is right before his 17th birthday. The bombs drop and then he goes down into the hold and he's on the fire suppression team and also he's picking up the pieces of the bodies. So he doesn't recount that all that much in his letters. I don't go into all of that, but that was his initiation to combat, that he's taking up parts of bodies. And he's doing this before he's 17 years old. His story then picks up with the other book. Uh, he goes through Bougainville, Saipan, Tinian, Peleliu, two invasions at the uh, Philippines, and then Okinawa. And he's at the front edge of uh, battle. So I'm gonna share with you the beginning part of what he told me through his writings. This is when he sends his, one of his letters, his first letter to his son, Harold. And he says, he starts out by saying, Harold, I will try through a series of letters to give you a little rundown on World War II. Like I said, he gave us about 300 pages. He says, and, and if I get a little salty or a little uh, here or there, it's him speaking, but uh, that, I just said a warning, okay? He says, I can't do much to convey to you such things as the stench of death, the oily, greasy, dirty, tore up, shell mutilated bodies, and dead men. I can't convey to you the fear on both mine and other men's facial features until their expressions are nothing but frozen fear and dread, and our faces look like they come out of a damn deep freezer. That's his 17 year old, or not quite 17 year old, that's his uh, first explanation of war. How can I explain to you how it feels to resign your soul to God and eternity and your body to a gallon of embalming fluid? Or the goddamn rat that keeps gnawing at your intestines? And yet there is a sanity in all this goddamn insane operation. You, a man, a soldier, a sailor, you have work to do and come hell, high water, death, destruction, life or death, you keep on doing, shooting, shitting, working, hollering, groaning, praying and cussing. You keep on doing your job like a goddamn man is supposed to do and after you wonder how in the hell you and others were able to do it. This is the beginning of his explanation of what happened to him. And then he gets off of what I would call a little bit of the, the negative. And, and in many places, he really explains the dull pain, the monotony, and then how it's accentuated by, by fear and terror. He says, most of the time it's only work, 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 making preparations, doing without rest and sleep, planning, training, doing boring work. Most of war is work, planning and education. It's mostly a dull, goddamn, absolute nothing. Most of the time you wish you were far, far away somewhere else. So that's the world that this young teenager was tossed into. Um, let me go to the next one here. This is uh, Saipan where he went to after uh, his service on board digging bodies out. And this is the lagoon here. And on Saipan, there was a barrier reef here that everybody got hung up on. And so this was where most of the, the troops were actually dumped off here. Some of them actually on high tide could get through. My dad was involved in this. And what's interesting is there was never a time in any of my dad's documentation or any of the associated work I did on the first book and none of the second book did I actually have evidence that they overlapped. My father was um, a senior sailor by then, more like he was in that second picture as being assault. He'd been on board for a long time. He was one of the plank holders and he was also had served as uh, master at arms. So um, he may have actually served under, I mean uh, JP may have served under my father. Uh, 
I know this for a fact from what my father told me, that JP was probably chased by my father on deck to find out where he's hiding all his liquor. Because that's what one of the things that my dad talked about and shared with me that as master at arms, he was always trying to find out where these guys were storing their hooch and making their raisin wine and all that. And there was a lot of the stuff in the letters that JP talked about that that's what he was doing. So he would have been much younger than my father, uh, less senior and probably involved in that. Um, here are some pictures. I, I share this in both books. If you look at these, take a look at those faces. Yeah. 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 Teenagers. Yeah. They're all teenagers. Uh, here, I think they're drinking something. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah. I affectionately call this, these are the Chicago boys. But of course, uh, JP was from Alabama, so he was not one of the Chicago boys. Um, what this uh, experience did for me was it introduced me really closely to the idea of PTSD. Uh, when I was reading JP's experience, um, what happens to him is he goes through the war and he's shell-shocked, he's uh, bombarded, shot at, um, he uh, tells about his experiences in many ways, and um, it's pretty obvious that the first thing these young men did was they went for the alcohol to numb themselves. And it's pretty telling. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to read all of the passages, but remember I went back to Harold. I told you I had to talk to him about writing this book. I think there's a story here. I had a very frank conversation with him, though. I said, there's one part of the story I'm going to have to tell, and it's going to be pretty embarrassing. And he knew exactly what it was. Um, JP got drunk when he was on leave in the Philippines and got so drunk, he's walking down the street with his best friend, and they got into one of those friendly fistfights with each other. And they got arrested by the shore patrol and put in a stockade. So they're on leave. This is probably somewhere towards the beginning of 1945, so they've been in the service for a while. And they're back in the Philippines, so they must have been going from you know the very end of the war, back when Okinawa was being staged, that kind of time frame, because he's in the Philippines doing this, he gets in a fight with his best friend, he's drunk, he gets thrown in a stockade, and he's in the stockade, and he finds a small little uh, square tunnel, and he tells everybody they're going to tunnel out. Well, that was the latrine. <laughs> and he went, tried to go through the latrine. And he, in the letter, recounts going to see the magistrate the next morning, covered in brown matter. <laughs> you know, and he, you can tell by his writing how he describes it. And he then was taken back to the ship and, you know, given, you know, demotions and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and you know, he's so drunk, and at that time I think he was maybe 18 years old, uh, that he crawled out through a crap, you know. And this was, this was not like the Shawshank Redemption getting out of the jail. You know, this was through, through, through the, as they say, through the shitter. And um, I, I said to uh, Harold, I said, I've got to put that in there. You know, that's so honest. That's, a, that's an event that's got to be shared. And he was like, oh, my goodness, because you know, he is now everything opposite of his father. He was embarrassed by his father. He was, he was, he was taken away from his father. His mother left him because of his father's drinking. Uh, he was raised by his aunts and his grandmother. He became, Harold is um, retired. Uh, he's a, a major in the Army Reserve. He has his own successful business. And his daughter is an um, engineer for NASA at Huntsville, and she puts satellites up, you know, and, and, and so they're, they're respectable people. And I'm going to write a story about, you know, the drunken, crazy grand grandfather of the family. And they had a family meeting, and that was the, the last, you know, uh, barrier I had to get through to, to actually get the book going. So um, what these guys went through was a lot of combat, tension, terror, and then they anesthetized themselves with alcohol and other things. Uh, one of the things I learned about PTSD is that the effects, when you go back and you study it, it starts actually with World War, uh, with uh, the, the shellings that went on in the Civil War. It really got intensified in World War One. You know, it's called shell shock and combat fatigue and all these different names. Uh, there's some very interesting names and theories about it. And it wasn't until after Vietnam and really into what's going on now in the Gulf War that there's been actually serious work and understanding of trying to deal with this. Uh, PTSD uh, is most um, seriously affects those who've 
been under bombardment, the concussion, uh, more so than being shot at by rifles and other things. Um, and it affects people who are younger and less educated. And when I wrap up, I'll share this and some other comments. But he's, think about this, he's underage, he hasn't finished high school, he quit, and he's undergone bombardments and other things. So he's a perfect candidate for PTSD. He comes home in 1946. This, uh, again, here's uh, what's interesting. This is just so somebody knows that this is not the South Pacific. Whoop, what happened here? Um, right here, can you see that little line up there? That's actually the cliffs in Normandy. So I don't want anybody to think I don't know my World War II pictures, okay? <laughs> I, I just want you to know that that's a great shot of what it looks like from the coxswain position of a Higgins boat when you're landing troops, right? Uh, imagine doing that three or four times a day and then going picking up bloody bodies and things back and forth, being shot at, and all that going on. Um, and one of the uh, accounts going in, I'm not going to read all these, I don't want to steal the thunder, but um, uh, he volunteers to take in a load of, on his uh, Higgins boat filled with Bangalore torpedoes, which is uh, just pure ammunition. And they were going in and they were being shelled as they came in, and they were so scared that rather than finish their mission, they stayed out there and just drifted until the sun came up so they could go the rest of the way because they, 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 they were scared. Um, another time, they were running supplies back and forth from the ship, going in and back and back and back and back. Uh, they were so delirious. I'm going to share with uh, you about PTSD. And this is from his account. One time after an unbelievable shelling, when I had 12 wounded men in my boat, which was badly damaged, I went into a state of mental shock. I thought maybe I was dead. Killed by shell fire, back to earth in spirit form. I didn't know for sure whether I was dead or not. So being the wise ass, I spoke to my crew, figuring if I was alive and could hear them answer me, yes, I was still alive. I spoke to my engineer and he answered me. Then the awful goddamn truth came. I could hear them because they were all dead and the whole damn bunch of us and we were just back on earth in spirit form. It was about three days before I realized that hell, we were still alive and not back to earth, earth in spirit form, I was in shock. That's one of his explanations years later about what happened to him. One of the other best ones is that uh, if you remember kamikaze attacks, at Okinawa there were six days of constant kamikaze attacks. Uh, he was worked and going back and forth shuttling, taking troops in and getting uh, 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 wounded back and being shot at and all that. He worked himself into such a frenzy that he was so tired, they relieved him and put him in the bottom of the boat to go to sleep. And he slept for six hours through the largest kamikaze attack and air raid in World War II. And he doesn't remember any of it. So that's part of what happened to him. Oh. And here he is. This is a kind of a grainy shot. I show this one because that's him when he wrote the letters as an old man. And you can't see this, but I'm going to point it out. See this right here? Pass the word, Thunderbird. Anybody recall what that is? Cheap wine. What? Thunderbird is a cheap wine. Cheap wine. Cheap wine. There are passages in this book where he writes and he recounts what happens. And then he puts a PS to Harold, his son, and says, thanks for the $20 you gave me. I bought three bottles of cheap wine, and I got drunk. Another one, he says, I didn't buy cheap wine. I bought really cheap wine. I got six bottles and got twice as drunk. He never held a job for more than six months after he came home. He went to work in a uh, textile mill, the repetitive sounds. One day, he just freaked out, and from then on, he went through electroshock therapy and in and out of veterans' hospitals. And somewhere, when Harold, his son, was a toddler, his wife left him, the child was taken away, and he was then labeled the town drunk. And that's the person he became. It's a really tough story. 
he always wanted to be a sailor man. When he writes these letters, he never whines about what happened to him. He explains it, he gives his view of war, and all through this experience, you get the knowledge of what it is for one person to give up their life in the long term for war. He was never wounded, he didn't get a Purple Heart, he came home before he was 20 years old. He left when he was 16, he came home before he was 20, and he never had a life after that. And in his 60s, he answered the question to his son, honestly, what happened? And he did that. He gave us these letters. I was able to read them and share with them. And I'm going to share some points with you about this experience. Um, every so often, I kind of get in my own wheelhouse, as they say, and I try to think about my own life. And what this book has done for me is given me the ability to say, I've really had a lot of good things happen to me. Uh, J.P. Nunley lost everything. He gave the most, and he didn't complain. And in the end, I'm not going to do it as a spoiler for the end of this book, he, uh, he gave us a message at the end. And when you read it, it really says a lot about the, the, the core fabric of our society that produced that 16-year-old boy that you saw on the bed. It, that was still within JP when he ended his life. Um, he, he was an honest, good person that had a lot of bad experiences, and he never complained. And there's, there's redemption in his experience. Um, this is a book that I'm really pleased to be associated with. If I could describe it, this is the kind of book that comes along once in a generation. And when I see it, I say, gee, if I hadn't written that book, that's the one book in the world I would want to have, have written. Because it's an experience of someone else, you know, I was able to, to actually be the, le the editor of his letters. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you about the, uh, the, 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 what these young underage veterans, and particularly the ones that went through things like him did. And this is uh, from a, uh, it's actually from a monograph that was done for a, uh, a master's thesis, so it's not a, a, a published document but it's available through some sources. But this is from uh, Children at War, the Underage Americans Illegally Fighting in the Second World War. Uh, Joshua Polarine did this, and it's in the uh, university, I think it's a university maybe in Montana or someplace. I can't remember. Uh, they left their schools, their friends, and their families with ideals of adventure and excitement to defend their nation and their homes. They soon learned the truth of war. Their experiences were beyond anything they could have imagined in their youthful dreams of glory. For all of them, the realities of war rapidly distilled any romantic notions of what defending America truly meant. They lost close friends, saw horrors that would haunt them throughout their lives, and suffered the devastating effects of combat on the body. Uh, I've been able to share this book with uh, children of World War II veterans that have experienced PTSD. Uh, several other writers have, have written to me and said, that's my father. Thank you for this book. What's really interesting is two of my roommates who I, I was at, you know, I went to the Citadel, and they're military people, and two of my roommates confided in me about their parents, their fathers. I knew their fathers when I was a cadet, but I never knew about that experience they went through and what it did to families, um, and the drunken rages, uh, the, the, the just all of the things that are there in society because of PTSD. So it's, this is a, a, a very important book. Um, I would, would encourage everybody to read it and share it. Um, uh, tonight, if you want a copy, um, it's $13.95 normally. Uh, I'm selling it for 10 bucks. And uh, the gangster is sixteen ninety five. That's for twelve bucks. But if you get both of them, it's two bucks for twenty. Uh, two bucks for twenty bucks. You can't beat that. <laughs> so if you ever wanted some good good books, here's the time to get that. But it's not because I want to sell books. What I'd like to do is get as many people to read and share these books to get the message out. I will guarantee that you can't read this book and not cry at the end. So and I don't want to be a spoiler. So I don't want to read the best part at the end. But I do want to share something for you. Um, just how good the book is. 
uh, there's a cert, there's a there's a review service in books that that goes only for books that are the undiscovered gems by small publishers or in little niches. And underrated reads looks for books like that. And before they even agree to review your book, you got to be one of those books. So Sailor Man was chosen as one of those books. They only do about 100 books a year that they look at. And if you go on their website, you read what they do. It's very interesting in how they describe these really good books. Well, within that grouping, they take a real small number every year and call them our best. And there were only three books last year that they selected out of all the books in the world. There are only three. And this was one of them. It was the first one they selected. And they gave it what they call, they don't give five stars, they give it five bookmarks. Okay. And they said this, the reviewer, I'll just read the first part and the last part. They said, it's tremendously touching and skillfully, skillfully written. Sailor Man is succinct, yet powerful, and it stunned me. That was from a, a, a lady reviewer. And she said, but this is interesting, you know, Sometimes we really think that ladies do not read all about World War II, but she said this, as an avid anything World War II kind of reader, Stacker's small book is like none other I've read, proving once again that less is more, because it is a short book. Sailor Man should be required reading in boot camp, in high school, somewhere. So I want to share this book with you. Um, in the end, I went through an experience which was really wonderful in life when I wrote about my experience about my dad. I never thought I'd end up writing a book that was nonfiction, sells pretty well, I'm asked to speak about it all the time, and then be given a second gift, this book right here. If you care about soldiers and sailors, if you care about anybody who's gone through any kind of trauma, please read it and share it. I think it's a really a significant book. Like I said, if I hadn't written it, I'd really want to write it. Um, it's, it's got the potential of influencing people as much as the Red Badge of Courage. It's really that good. It's really that interesting. And if you really want to cry at the end, there's a poem that he wrote that was found in his documents at the end, and it really wraps things up. What really gets me is when I went through my dad's documents and found some things. It wasn't his own poem. It was a different one. In the end of the other book, there's another poem that was in my dad's things. And so, and this is the last thing I want to share about this, and then I'll answer questions. What does all this do? Well, the end product is I have a great experience. I talk about these books forever. But I also, it's kind of like I got another brother. Because Harold Nunnally invited me down. My wife and I have went down and shared time with him and his family. And it's just like being brought in like this. Harold and I are almost the exact same age. Um, we immediately just bonded and liked each other, even though we'd had this experience over the phone and emails for years, because it took about three years for me to put all this together. But it's a, it's a healing. Uh, this was a healing process for he and his family. Uh, we were sitting down, and he shared with his family things about his father that he'd never been able to talk about, which helped heal them. And then his daughter shared things about the grandfather that nobody knew about that while he was writing this series of letters to his son, explaining his what happened, he was also writing another set of correspondence to his granddaughter, trying to be a grandfather, to someone who he had no contact with. Remember, he'd only seen his son 10 hours in his adult life. For, you know, so it's really interesting. And then um, the closure of this experience was really important because uh, JP died by himself is the situation was not very nice and Harold always felt guilty about the circumstances and, and what actually happened. And once this book was done, um, it gave him closure. And then the greatest closure was this. Uh, back in October, uh, this book won the Gold Ward for memoir from the Military Writers Society of America. It's the only Gold Award they got out for memoir. It was to this book. and. Uh, the president of that association did a, a blurb on the back of the book and so he knew about it. I was not there to receive the award and so he emailed me and then he called me and says, I've actually got your medal and I'm going to send it to you. So a couple days later in the mail I got the gold medal for this award for this book and I sent it to Harold and now it hangs with JP's medals for his service during World War II. 
So there's really a closure and a, and a, and a completion of that story. So I just want to share that with you. So please, I'm, I'm not touting my book. I'm just saying buy them and read them and share them with as many friends as you can, okay? And thank you again for inviting me here tonight. I'll answer any questions. Yes, sir. I have an uh, observation and question. Yeah. Um, kind of. uh, <clears throat> during the um, uh, Army, uh, 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 with regard to the Army Air Forces, Hap Arnold put into effect a redistribution program yeah. where they got the hotels at Atlantic City, Miami. Yeah. And the guys came back, they got together, they relaxed, and then they were, were sent someplace else where they'd talk with other people about their experiences help them, what are they going to do next day in the military, and so forth. Mm -hmm. That was great, and a lot less, fewer people in the Army Air Forces would be eventually affected that way. I have, uh, I know a kid, his father went to West Point, a great football player. Yeah. He was a great football player, in fact, two of his roommates are great pros, and yeah. if I told you who they were, you'd say, wow. Okay. And he was in, uh, he was what they call a kicker in the military. Yeah. Kicked down the door and just blasted away. Yeah. Following orders. He was recently declared unemployable. Yeah. The, the, the army did, did nothing. All the expenses that his family went through was through the family. Yeah. And, and that is something that, that someone's got to do something about because he obviously has this thing. And if you saw him, he looks like Adonis, and, um, and he he was um, all Mac uh, linebacker and really yeah. tremendous guy. Mm -hmm. But he was ordered to do things that <laughs> that that's, you can't even imagine. Yeah. And uh, and they don't have programs like that now. Like Hap Arnold's program is just. I mean, you've got to respect this man for thinking of something like that. That's why he had three heart attacks and yeah. didn't live well long because he um, didn't worry about. It. I think you, you, could, you could talk forever about what we do not do after the fact for veterans in America. Um, I think that what's interesting, when, when we were growing up in my age group, you know, the, uh, the projected uh, uh, uncivilized behavior of the Japanese uh, uh, military was always projected out that they were just terrible. And when you go to Japanese culture, uh, their uh, problems with re-entry of servicemen, PTSD and other related things is minimal compared to ours because they actually had a cultural process of reintegrating people to bring them back. They actually had the rituals and ceremony, a cleansing and other things that took care of that. Uh, we're very unsophisticated about that. We're terrible. Every time I see a, 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 a commercial on TV for wounded war warriors, I get incensed uh, because I do not think wounded warriors should exist. I think our VA department is supposed to be wounded warriors. Uh, I'm a veteran. Um, I. You know, I was lucky. You know, I got shot at once in training, you know, by mistake, and uh, I still remember it. So I imagine if it was somebody who, you know, been serious about it, uh, uh, many of my uh, colleagues, cohorts, uh, people in, in my age group went through those kinds of things. I know all of that, and then that was 40 some years ago. I'm 65 years old. That's a different generation now. All this stuff, and we're doing this over and over again. You know, I think it's disgusting what we we do not do for our veterans. So I I agree with you 100. percent I don't know what to do about it. Uh, I'll just share with you, and this is getting me out of the story, but if I only could tell you what I went through just to try to get my DD-214, which is my paperwork that says I'm a veteran, I, I can't tell you what I've gone through. And the non-responsiveness of our, quote, the system to veterans, it's just unbelievable. I can't imagine how I would feel if I actually had a medical problem. I'm just trying to validate the fact that, you know, I get a card that says I'm a veteran. If I want to go to Shoney's or or, you know, trying to sit down south of a restaurant and get my free meal or something or, or whatever. But uh, we're unresponsive. So this process of going through, you know, uh, I really thought about the name Sailor Man because, uh, you know, he, he refers to himself as Sailor Man to his family. Uh, he saw himself as that. And this is the actual, uh, this picture, by the way, is from the recruiting brochure, the actual one. Um, and that's there. And I, I, I saw quote from it, all kinds of stuff. It's very in-depth. You know, how he was maneuvered. If you read the actual document, if you actually have that, it's, it's total, total blarney. It is total um, uh, public relations. It's, it's, as, it's as phony as a John Wayne movie. And that's what they were fed. And he was 16 years old and he gave everything up and he lost his life and it's just a real loss. So I don't know what to do. You know? yeah, there's, 
some political people today well, saying they're going to make the VA great. The presidential yeah. Debates, yeah. You know, yeah. So. They all say things. How many times have they said that? Right. Yeah. 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 When uh, you mentioned that he was uh, at one point stunned for three days, and yeah, could he have been drinking heavily at that point? Not or? at that time. No, that would have, that would have been right when he was shuttling and and actually under combat. Uh, the stress that they went under, and and just the work, you know, um, you know, you know. I, 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 when I was in training, interesting. When I was in service and training, uh, we were taught that uh, the. Uh, military person from age 17 to 24 can be worked constantly for up to 80 hours. And that actually matches uh, the, the same uh, time frame that uh, General Patton used in World War II. You know, after a certain amount of time, just spent. But if they push people that long, you know. And, 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 you know, once you get 24, you can't do that. Your recovery time isn't. But, you know, I don't think he was drinking at that time. You know, uh, as, soon as, as soon as it was over, they were. They had it hidden. Uh, it's actually what's interesting is after the war was over, well, he, you know, he recounts stealing a lot of beer off of, you know, the, the, the docks and other stuff. And, and uh, actually, there's one interesting one where an ensign is involved in the scam with him, pilfering beer and selling it. But he was so addicted to painkillers that after the war was over in uh, the time frame of late 45, 46, he was up in Puget Sound. The war was over. Uh, he was running uh, his... Uh, boat back down to Seattle to pick people up going uh, Liberty Leaves and things like uh, cruises and stuff and they actually found on one of the decks uh, uh, pharmaceutical grade cocaine other drink other other stuff and they stole it and he uh, got so scared he threw it all overboard eventually but it got that bad for painkillers and he admits this you know he, in, you know in his letters now I didn't put all of that in there but uh, th he was totally addicted to alcohol by the time he was 17 and a half, you know, and, and I, I, a lot of it's in here about going on, all he did was drink. We got leave, they went into town, he'd love to drink Tom Collins, you know, that was his drink of choice. But they, but they drank hooch, uh, raisin wine, Apple Jack, uh, they, they, they drained uh, fluids, you know, radiator fluid, other stuff through bread, you know, other kinds, it's all there, you know. Uh, but, but actually, while on duty, they were not, they were not high. At least he had never admitted to and I, I think he would have admitted to that. He was very honest in his letters. Any other questions? Comments? Last chance? Please, if you want. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Now, you mentioned something about people being embarrassed. They didn't talk about these things. And that's yeah. the way the world was back then. And yeah. Nobody would ever mention that uh, they had a son they could call and he was really not, you know, it was all very secretive. But today, thank God, they brought it out in the open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been there, and and, and I'm going to share with you that also within the military, I, I hit on it a little bit on that chapter about how the military is not um, uh, con con conducive to admitting this. Uh, this book was shared with um, uh, combat veterans from that that I know and a network of people uh, from my alma mater that uh, these were career combat military people that read this. And one of them, a retired lieutenant colonel from, you know, like Special Forces, Ranger background from Vietnam, said he did not believe in PTSD. <coughs> because he said he personally did not experience it, and he did not personally experience it with the small number of troops that he was with, so he was skeptical if it really existed. And he thinks that people like this are just crybabies and wanna, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Now this is a guy who's probably in his 70s, pushing 80 today. Served, you know, very well, combat veteran, and you know, probably you know one of those guys like you know, a couple years older than me. Yeah, and but yeah, but the, but the, 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 the mind frame there is because he didn't see it, and it's not his experience. It's not true, and even though there's this overwhelming uh, evidence for it, you know, um, uh, the other thing that happened for me that how this awakened all of this, and I wanted to write this was my dad was older, see he was not the, the young, uneducated person. My dad went through more in some ways than JP did, and longer, but did not have PTSD. And I accounted to the fact he was older, better educated, and had far, far stronger for himself, because I, I, I know my father, 
um, he had a very strong spiritual base. And, and, and although JP did too, I think those other factors weighed against that because uh, uh, he could have just had addictive behavior. Yeah, yeah, and that could have been there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad, I don't think, had addictive behavior. Uh, that, that, and, you know, but, uh, but when we look at this, um, I can't tell you how many times I've had emails and letters and, and communication from people saying that their parent, their father, was one of these guys that came home that never had a scar visibly on their body, but it was up here and in here. And that was JP. Um, it's really a tough story, but in the end there is some, some redemption. And I don't want to be a spoiler. Any more? So if you want a good deal on books, come see me, okay? Thank you. And I want to thank you all for coming out, and uh, hopefully we'll support the author.